Hello, and welcome again to our study of Fireproof Faith. I'm Corey Collins with Keller Church of Christ, and today we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, talking about our relationships at home. I have with me today this tiny object that I brought back from Israel in 1996. It is an oil lamp said to be dated to the Roman era and the time of Christ. I hope that that's authentic, but in any case, it would be used to hold oil and therefore provide a lamp, a light in the darkness. Might have been this kind of lamp that the virgins, the bridesmaids in Matthew 25 were to have ready with their oil, and you can see where it might run out after a rather short time, but as they looked for the bridegroom to arrive. We're going to talk in 1 Peter chapter 3 about the precious value of a godly woman as a vessel, carrying God's treasure, God's grace, God's love, and God's mercy, even in a difficult situation where her husband may not be obedient to the word of God. What is she to do? Our topic then is our relationships in the home and how does our connection with Jesus Christ transform and inform and direct us as we participate, first uh, the woman in the home, and then in verse seven, the husband in the home, and then verses eight and nine, summing up, pulling it together, the qualities that apply to all of us that can cause uh, the family relationship to thrive, to please God, and to be a blessing to all who are part of that family. Well, I'm starting with uh, also this image of the paper dolls and the children because of a story that I heard some years ago in which there was a little boy that came to his daddy who was tired after a long day of work. And he said, daddy, 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 I want you to play with me. And the father was looking for some way to occupy the child without having to get up right then and sit on the floor and do something with him. And so the father saw a newspaper and in the newspaper, there was a picture of all the nations of the world. And he said, son, give me just a minute. And he cut that newspaper image with the whole world on it into many pieces. And he gave it to the little boy with scissors and scotch tape. And he said, I'll tell you what, you go over to the other part of the room and you put the map of the world back together. And when you do, you come back and get me and then I will be ready to play with you. And the father thought he could catch a few winks short nap maybe on the sofa while his son put the map of the world back together. Well, he closed his eyes and he lay down and it seemed like just 10 minutes later, the little boy said, daddy, 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 I, I did it, I did it. And the father was amazed and couldn't believe it. But sure enough, there was the entire world, all the parts put where they fit. And he said, how did you do it? And especially so quickly, son. And the child said, well, daddy, when I looked on the other side, I saw that there was a picture of a family. And I could recognize who was the daddy and who was the mommy and where the children fit in the picture. And he said, so I put the pieces together on the flip side. And once I had the family as it was intended to be, then I turned it over and found that I had put the whole world together too. What a powerful principle that the family is the basic building block of society. Before the city or the state or the nation or even the church, God put a man and woman together and he intended that under his guidance, they would be fruitful and multiply. And you and I know that from the beginning with Adam and Eve, 
the family has been plagued with temptation, with sin, and with danger. And that that serpent, that snake in the grass, wants nothing more than to attack wives and husbands and children. And in this time of sexual revolution, gender confusion and identity, and all of the somewhat surprising elements, even in our day, of what disrupts the meaning of being a man, being a woman, being a son, being a daughter. But if we'll go back to the original blueprint, to the plan that God gave, to his definition of marriage, gender, sexuality, family, then if we can get the family the way God designed it to be, we'll find that the world will come together as a result. And of course, all of that starts and focuses on and points to Jesus Christ. So in Peter's first inspired letter, we've come to Jesus as the cornerstone. And then we are living stones, part of that spiritual structure. We're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. We are offering up our lives and all that we have as sacrifices to the Lord. And out of that, we therefore see ourselves as civilians honoring authority in government. In the first century, those that were under the direction of masters, they're addressed next. And then in 1 Peter 2, 21 to 25, Jesus himself as the ideal example of one who put up with tough mistreatment and hardship and affliction. He never retaliated. He kept trusting the one who judges justly. And so he's the chief shepherd. He's the guardian. He's the overseer of our souls. All we like sheep had gone astray, but through Jesus Christ, as Isaiah 53 prophesied, and we see fulfilled in the gospel, through Jesus Christ, we now have a relationship with God the Father. Now let's think about fireproof faith and where we are so far in our study and where we're headed. Again, the resources at servingandsharing.com and also on this YouTube channel. We're going to come now after our salvation and our holy commitment, our place as a stone in God's program, our Christ-like submission in the various roles and responsibilities that we have, now to bring that around to the home. And we'll go through verse nine. We don't know exactly where to break this topic. I was going to end it at verse seven, but. As I've studied it further, let's continue and open verses 1 through 9. That will lead us to the secret to enjoying a, a God-centered life at the end of chapter 3, and then the change we've made from sin to service and our joy and suffering, and that will prepare us for chapter 5. But let's start now with our Bibles open, 1 Peter 3, verses 1 and 2. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Many times people poke fun at the challenges of marriage, and they question whether a husband and wife can truly be happy together, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, until one of them dies. Sometimes we see, even in our children, a reflection of what's going on in our society. I learned from a woman named Sonia R. Eli in Oregon that she was watching her five-year-old granddaughter, Christy, play with their dolls. Little Christy, age five, staged a wedding. First, Christy was the bride's mother, assigning the specific duties for the wedding. Then suddenly, 
Christy became the bride and had her teddy bear as the groom. She picked up the teddy bear and then she said to the minister presiding over the wedding, now you can read us our rights. <laughs> Without missing a beat, little Christy became the minister. And as the minister, Christy said, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say may be held against you. You have the right to have an attorney present. You may kiss the bride. Well, as silly as that is, and as sad as that is, it also reflects what's going on in our world. And uh, so many who say, I do, decide later, I don't or I won't. And vows may be conditional. Instead of till death do us part, they will say, as long as our love shall last. And so the wedding uh, union is conditioned with if, and, or but, or uh, as long as, or until. And so now couples even hesitate to get married. And so cohabitation is on the rise, even though statistics show that couples who cohabit are much more likely to divorce after they do marry than if they had waited, as the Bible teaches, saving themselves and the marital relationship for the time that they would become husband and wife. And today, perhaps more than ever, the very idea of submission or subordination or one yielding to another seems unthinkable and disgraceful. And so we live in an age where many people see marriage as egalitarian, that is, the husband and the wife together, as long as the two agree 100%, they stay together. But when one has a difference of judgment, then unless they can persuade the other, they may go their separate ways. God's design from the start is that the husband submitted to God loving, trusting, respecting, obeying his master would then be the loving head, the leader, the Christ-like protector and guide and guard for his wife and his children. And so as we see in scripture, whenever that pattern was observed, good things happened because the wife would respect her husband's leadership as he respected his head in heaven. And they would have harmony and a mutual understanding that she would get behind him and help him and lift him up because it's not good for man to be alone. And the man would, as one accountable to God, himself surrendered to God, uh, take his wife and his children into directions and into a future that would please God and one day find them all in heaven. But in 1 Peter 3, we have to remember that this letter is written to those from a pagan Gentile background, many of them married before they decided to follow Jesus. And now, uh, perhaps if the man had decided to become a Christian, he might have led his family in the, the Roman uh, age of their time and led his whole family. But what if the woman decided the gospel was the truth and she repents and she confesses and she's baptized and she goes back home to that man who is not at that point? And so it's in that context that we read uh, of this important influence and effect that she can have on her husband. Now go back to chapter two. If Christians are to respect the king, the emperor, the governor, if the servant was to follow the master's direction, what about the home? And notice how this verse one begins, in the same way. Well, in the same way as what or, or who? Well, as citizens, as servants, and then chapter 2, 21 to 25, as Jesus' 
Christ, look what he endured, look what he experienced, look what he had to go through for the redemptive purpose of bringing us back to God. What if a woman married to a non-Christian could see herself as having a redemptive role? Let me go ahead and mention 1 Corinthians 7, 12 through 16, that how do you know, O woman, the Bible says, whether you might save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, married to a non-Christian wife, whether you might save your wife? This is 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 12. If any brother has a wife who's an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman with an unbelieving husband, if he consents to live with her, uh, she must not send her husband away. Uh, verse 13, there, uh, 14, there's a sanctifying influence. That is, the, the Christian brings an element of holiness, of sanctity, something sacred into the marriage. That does not mean that the lost, unchristian spouse is automatically saved. It simply means that there's some light, uh, there's some influence of the gospel that's in that home because of the Christian mate that otherwise would not be there. And it affects the children also in verse 14. When the Bible says the unbelieving husband is sanctified, uh, and so the children are now holy, it's talking about the fact that there's a holy person in the home. So then uh, verse 16, how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? So uh, in the middle of that is verse 15, recognition that the marriage may not be salvageable if the unbelieving mate insists on leaving. So there's certainly a limit to what the wife or the husband can do in this relationship, but to consider the possibility that by getting behind her husband and behaving in a way that is persuasive, attractive, uh, without a word, that is not by nagging, not by lecturing, not by pushing, but instead by exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit, the love and joy and peace and patience. So the husband observes that. And in this way, the wife imitates Christ, obeys God, and there, there's the possibility. Now, if, if the Christian is not married, we're going to say marry a Christian because the outcome of winning the non-Christian to Christ is is an exception. It's rather rare. It often happens the other way, that the Christian is pulled back into the world and to compromise a complacency. But if you're married to a non-Christian already, you are the salt that flavors your marriage, Matthew 5. You are the light uh, in your world, Matthew 5, 13 to 16. So, uh, uh, Silence is golden. You know, sometimes we think, and I'm certainly, as a, as a proclaimer of the Word of God, I want to take the Scriptures, and, and thus says the Lord. And there's a place for that. But sometimes silence is louder. Sometimes it's the sermon you live, not the sermon you proclaim. Now, the two need to go together, but here's what happens. If I say one thing, but I live in contradiction to that, my spouse is going to see the dissonance, the contrast, and is going to hear the message of my life much more um, uh, effectively than, than my verbal presentation. This is the same with children. We cannot stress this enough. We can lecture our children all day long. We can tell them what they have to do, even what God says they have to do. But mom and dad, unless we're living that way ourselves, that may fall on deaf ears. There's a poem entitled, I'd Rather See a Sermon 
than hear one any day. It is the example, it's what's demonstrated or modeled that is much, much easier to follow. When a wife is chaste, that means that she lives as a holy woman. Uh, we all have flaws. When I say without flaw, undefiled, no one is perfect. We're not saying that. But there's a consistency, there's a quality to her conduct that is very impressive. And this Bible translates respectful, literally in fear. Now, the Bible has already talked about uh, fearing the king, uh, fearing God. There's a certain level of respect, and I think respectful here is a good translation, but keep in mind, we're talking about um, uh, setting our, our husbands or those in leadership in our lives in a very special place and regarding them like that. Now, are there limits? Certainly there are, and we talked about that in 1 Corinthians 12 at verse uh, 15, if the mate uh, breaks up the marriage, and certainly if there's physical danger or abuse or the required disobedience to God. Remember what we said last time, Acts 4 and also Acts 5. We must obey God rather than men. But generally speaking, if we can obey the laws of the land and show the difference that Christ makes, if we can put up with a master or boss and vindicate the reality of the gospel. If a wife can, can put up with and tolerate and, and, and even get behind her husband and keep living a Christ-like life, how powerful that is to be supportive and also exemplary. Well, love to talk about that some more. We'll touch on it when we uh, mention next that what makes a person attractive in the sight of God is often in conflict with what society says uh, defines beauty. And Peter here, just like Paul elsewhere, uh, talks about the contrast between an emphasis on outward packaging and a priority on the content within. You know, the outside of what we see in people or products or a host of other things, the, the external can be so slick and shiny and tempting even that we can go and follow after a thing or after a person, after a relationship based on uh, the eyes. Look at where Peter mentions the hidden person of the heart. Something that's not always obvious to the naked eye, but it is imperishable, it is unfading beauty that a godly man, if he looks for it, he'll find it. And it's not in the outside package. It's in the heart. And the ungodly man can be drawn to it and can realize there's something much deeper, much more lasting, much more precious than the outside that fades over time, that gets wrinkled, that ages. This word adorn has to do with making oneself attractive. And the Bible talks about, for example, in Titus 2, 9 and 10, how servants in the first century could adorn the doctrine by the way they supported those who had authority over them. In 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10, uh, women especially are exhorted to be modest in, we would say, attitude and dress and behavior. That the adornment 
that makes a woman beautiful is that which is precious in the sight of God. The word gentle is the same term in the original that Jesus used when he said, blessed are the meek, Matthew 5, 5. This does not mean a person is weak, but rather that this individual's strength is brought under uh, God's guidance. And so uh, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus spoke of himself, take my yoke upon you. Uh, I am meek and gentle. Here it is, meek and gentle in spirit, and you'll find rest for your souls. Second Corinthians 10, 1, Paul addressed the church with the meekness and gentleness of Christ. That next should be G-A-L, Galatians 5, 23. The fruit of the spirit, love, joy, gentleness. Galatians 6, 1, restore the person in sin in a spirit of gentleness. And so to be uh, gentle, even to be quiet, which means peaceful or calm, it's our prayer that we can live quiet lives and that the government will allow us to live without disruption, without disturbance, without, you know, violence. Uh, it, it's good to be gentle and quiet. We could look at more references, but this woman is not pushy. She doesn't nag. She doesn't aggravate or irritate or rile her husband up. She is beautiful on the inside. That is her priority, not the pretty package, but the precious content. And then we have uh, respectful and righteous, noting that the holy women in former times, when I see this, I think to myself, holiness and hoping in God, that's what enables a woman to uh, support or be subject to her husband. Notice how Peter again notes the word uh, adorn. How did women who pleased God long ago, how did they adorn themselves? Well, he says in this way, that is a gentle and quiet spirit, righteous behavior, conduct, perhaps uh, with very few words, but in action so that their husbands knew the quality, the value, the precious nature of their wives. In our day, the word submit is not very popular, nor is the word obey, as we see in verse six, that Sarah obeyed Abraham. You and I have attended some weddings in which as part of the vows, the Christian woman agreed to obey her husband. Sarah obeyed Abraham, and she is the mother of women who do what is right and are not frightened by any terror and who seek to get behind their husbands, help them, work with them, support them, submit to them, because first, this woman is holy, and she has put her hope in God. Tough at times. In uh, Genesis 16, you remember the conflict with Abraham and Sarah and the lack of a child, and what happened with uh, Hagar, that uh, Abraham uh, slept with her, and the result was Ishmael and all kinds of conflict and trouble. And then Genesis 22, what was it like for Sarah when Abraham was told to take Isaac, who had finally been born after all those years, and offer him where God would take Abraham? And yet there was an understanding that Abraham was to be the leader. He was to do what God would have him do, and his wife was to agree to that arrangement. Even though Peter is writing to women whose husbands may not be Christians, 
may not be believers. That makes the model of Sarah even tougher. And we've said there are limits. Uh, the woman is not to remain in a physically or verbally uh, uh, dangerous uh, relationship or situation. We've said sometimes the spouse may not agree to let the wife live for Jesus Christ. So it's, it's tough. This passage is tough, as chapter 2 was. We talked about servants under masters, not just those that are gentle and good, but even masters that were harsh. And we say, no, 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 that's not right. But there may be a redemptive purpose that that husband can be one to Christ. And it's not going to be through rebellion and resistance and resentment and nagging. It's going to be because that husband sees something in his wife that he does not have. And he can't explain it any other way except for the Spirit of God. Well, let's talk about this word, Lord. It's used to mean, in a respectful way, something like, Sir, it recognizes the person in authority. For example, in John chapter 4, when Jesus sat with the woman at the well, and she said something like, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Well, she wasn't necessarily calling Jesus Lord in the sense of deity, though he was and is deity. She's still trying to figure out who Jesus is. But in that society, she recognized him as one that she should respect. And so most Bibles translate there as, as, as sir. This is not uh, uh, inappropriate at all uh, in biblical language. And so we understand that a wife who imitates Sarah speaks to her husband in, in respectful language. It doesn't mean that he is the divine, uh, you know, uh, overlord in the home and she's somehow a doormat. It doesn't mean that, but rather that uh, she understands the leadership responsibility that he has. And I think it's tremendous here to see how Scripture recognizes not only in the importance of Abraham, oh boy, uh, faith, and all of us who have faith, we are children of Abraham. The Bible teaches that, Galatians chapter 3. But the Bible also teaches that Sarah is the mother of, of women who do what is right and are not frightened by fear and have the courage and the character and the attitude and the spirit to be a godly wife, even when the husband is not leading her in the ways of Christ. And by the way, Hebrews chapter 11 also commends Sarah and says that she became the mother of many nations. Say, wait a minute, I thought Abraham was the father of many nations. He is, but look how the word of God identifies the woman and the precious value that she has. So if a woman today sees Sarah as an example, it would seem reasonable that the women that follow this woman's example today will also gain benefit. And so uh, our, our Christian sisters can realize that they want to follow godly examples. And in the process, they will become godly examples. So ladies, your daughters will learn from you how a woman can hopefully choose a godly man who will lead her and the family to heaven, but also how she can support and get behind her husband, even in situations that, that are not so ideal. So what's a woman to do? Do what is right. 
Live with security and confidence. Don't be frightened by any fear. And that last word, fear, is a very strong word that has to do with terror, uh, with those things that are very alarming. And this is a woman that knows ultimately if she serves God and obeys God in her situation as best she can, that there's no uh, power on earth that can ultimately defeat her. And now verse seven, husbands in an understanding way, aware, live with your wives, grant her honor, that is appreciate her, see her value and treat her accordingly. She's a fellow heir of the grace of life and you don't want your prayers or your relationship with God to be blocked because you didn't act as God would have you to with the person closest to you. So now we understand Christian husbands in the same way, in the same way as what? Well, to some extent, in the same way as we've just seen the wife, to, uh, to, to be a partner, to get behind, to support, to, to help your wife. Also, in the same way as Christ, chapter 2, 21 to 25, in the same way as servants to their masters, chapter 2, or civilians with the emperor and the governor. In an understanding way, the original text says, according to knowledge, that is, know your wife inside and out, know her personality, her needs, her desires, her worries and joys. Commit yourself, men. To, to recognizing what makes your wife the most special, precious creature. And she's committed her life to God and to you. She's going to stay with you. Men, you know, it's, oh, it's overwhelming to think of the trust that our wives have put in us. Uh, I want to talk about this word vessel. And often I read the New American Standard translation. But unfortunately, that translation removed the word vessel. It's preserved in the English Standard Version, and it should be. It's an important word. A vessel is an instrument. It is a, uh, a container. It is something that has cargo, perhaps very precious cargo in it. I started today by talking about this oil lamp purported to come from the first century era, the Roman period. And think about this as perhaps fragile. I could break it. I treat it very cautiously. It is a weak vessel but it could be filled with oil that would light up the whole room. When you think of your precious wife as carrying the grace of God, the love of God, she's the gift of God to, to you. And so the fact that the Bible will call her a weaker vessel is not an insult. It's not a criticism. It has nothing to do with her intellect or her value or her importance in your life or the family or the world. It has to do with the fact that the man is to be the protector, the guardian. He is to be the one to secure and care for and, and be the roof over her head. And so husbands, we can't emphasize enough the role that we play as those who recognize areas in which we may be stronger physically and so forth and choose to honor our wives. Here's a lot of uh, uh, emphasis on vessels in scripture. I'll mention uh, Acts 9.15, that Saul of Tarsus would be the Lord's chosen vessel to carry the gospel. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. 1 Thessalonians 4, 4. 
your body is the vessel that you use to serve God. And 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21 talks about vessels in a house. You want to be a vessel of honor, fit for the master's use. So uh, uh, look at fellow heir. Again, notice the equal share in God's inheritance. And then notice that uh, one, the man is to treat his wife with honor. If I could recommend a couple of books to you today, one would be Gary Smalley's book, Love is a Decision. And in this book, in chapter four, he has a chapter on honor as the foundation of one's relationship. And he says, here are the top 10 dishonoring acts in the home. Ignoring or degrading another person's opinions, advice, or beliefs. That is dishonoring. The second one, burying oneself in the television or newspaper when another person is trying to communicate with us. Third, creating jokes about another person's weak areas or shortcomings, sarcasm, cutting jokes, do lasting harm. Number four, making regular verbal attacks on loved ones, criticizing harshly, being judgmental, delivering uncaring lectures. Next, treating in-laws or other relatives as unimportant in one's planning and communication. Ignoring or simply not expressing appreciation for kind deeds done for us. Distasteful habits that are practiced in front of the family even after we're asked to stop, things that annoy. Next, overcommitting ourselves to other projects or people so that everything outside the home seems more important than those things inside the home. Next, power struggles that leave one person feeling that he or she is a child or is being harshly dominated. And number 10, an unwillingness to admit that we are wrong an unwillingness to ask for forgiveness. Perhaps you would like to read that book, Love is a Decision by Gary Smalley, and especially that chapter that talks about honor as the foundation for a healthy relationship. And I'll mention another book also, and that is Love and Respect by Dr. Emerson Egerix. And he takes Ephesians 5, 33, and he says what the wife primarily needs, that the husband most needs to give her, is love. And what the man needs most that he receives from his wife is respect. And when a woman respects her husband and a husband loves her wife, you have that Christ uh, modeled marriage. The husband, head of the wife, as Christ is to the church. The wife submitted to her husband as the church is to Christ. So I recommend that book, Love and Respect, that might be helpful to you. Well, quickly now, as our time runs out, these are the traits that I'm convinced if every person in the home dedicated that person's heart to being like-minded of one accord, being like-feeling, compassionate toward others' sorrows, tender and considerate, lowly and yielding, self-denying, not retaliating, but instead uh, giving the blessing that we were called to inherit from God. Think about what could happen to that home and that family when the decision is made to put the family together the way that God designed it and intended it. Well, we'll have to stop there for now. We'll look forward next time. We'll pick up again with verses eight and nine, and we're going on to talk about uh, what makes a purposeful life that pleases God and makes the difference in this world imitating Jesus Christ, who makes all the difference for us. So until 
we meet again, be a vessel for honor that carries the light, carries the oil, carries the grace and mercy and power and love of God. If you're enjoying these classes, please share them with others. And remember, there will be notes on the blog at servingandsharing.com.